Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. We meet each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome the best selling author, Mireille Giuliano, to the program. Her first book, French Women Don't Get Fat, The Secret of Eating for Pleasure, was a huge success, followed by French Women for All Seasons, a year of secrets, recipes, and pleasure. In her third book, the former CEO of Clicquot Inc. and spokesperson for Champagne Veuve Clicquot offers women advice about finding success and balance in their work and in their private lives. Women, Work, and the Art of Savoir Faire has just been published by Atria Books. Good morning. Good morning, Cheryl. So why did you decide to write this book now? Actually, it's a very good question because I didn't intend to write a business book, but as I was lecturing in many universities on the infamous Freshman 15, uh, many young women came at the end of my talks and said, you know, um, we didn't realize you had such a, an important career and you should write about it because we need mentors. And it rang a bell because throughout my life, uh, my career, I mentored young women sort of uh, on an uh, unofficial basis. But I didn't think it was that important. And of course, I did my little research and I looked at, at books. And as you know, most business books are by men. Right. We work in a man's world, so uh, rules are made by men. And further, I found that there was a paucity of um, business book by women, and also um, that there were not many people I talked to who said they had mentors. And I think with what's happening in the 21st century, uh, we need to speed up and we need to help each other. And, we, and mentoring is very essential. It does appear that men in the work world get mentored more than women do. Yes. Um, so what can women do to find mentors, to find the mentoring that they obviously need? Well, it's, it's obviously the, the subject of my book and the reason why um, I think we need to alert women because what we found that is, first of all, when in a big room you ask women if they've had mentor, uh, very few have. And among the ones who have, mostly men have been their mentors. Right. So what are the women doing? And um, it's, it's a very complex um, set of reasons why women are not doing mentorings. But I think now, with over uh, the majority of the workforce being women and growing, uh, college-educated uh, women are now the majority, and we need to speed up. And so it's time for women to help young women, and they all need help. Not that doesn't mean that you know young women won't make mistakes. We all make mistakes, but we can help them avoid and make a lot of mistakes that we made <clears throat> and that are still valid today. I mean, I'm amazed sometimes as. Uh, the mentoring can take, you know, from an hour to a year. Uh, but women at school are not taught about how to write a resume, how to present themselves, how to do a lot of things that you learn sort of once you start working. And so if we can help, and, and most of us, you know, with experience can, can help, uh, we should do so. And we should not, you know, forget about the younger generation, forget about women, or be complacent and not give our time. It's very important that we are in a different mode right now because I strongly believe that women are going to rule the world. And when we rule the world, we'll have to change those rules because there won't be men's rule anymore. And as I often said, we won't have meetings at 7.30 p.m. Right. <laughs> so, you know, let's get prepared for that <clears throat> right. and let's help each other. You write in your book about the mentoring that you did to a young woman named Maria, yes. a talented young woman who was stuck in this dead-end job, dying to get out of it, but really mm -hmm. didn't know how. And you really engaged in some very proactive mentoring. It wasn't mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, giving her a little pep talk or a little yeah. advice. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was down the line from the resume to, 
you know, think about the different things that you can do to introduce, giving her to giving her name to people, to mm -hmm. following mm -hmm. up. Um, and I assume that you believe that other women, you know, uh, who are who, who have got it made should take that kind of role. Oh, a really absolutely. proactive yes, role yes. in mentoring other women. Yes, it's not enough to just say, you know, <clears throat> sometimes I hear uh, young ladies who said, well, yeah, I was given that uh, phone number, you know, she made a phone call for me. That's not mentoring. You know, that's like vague networking. But if they don't follow up, uh, and sometimes that's why I said it could take an hour, but in the case of Maria, and I'm very happy to report, I just talked to her recently, she's now in her second year, she loves her job. She's learned a lot. She's going to um, go for an evening MBA on the side because she, she f is very curious about the business world. Mm -hmm. uh, she did very, very well the first year. But, you know, throughout the year, she called me a few times where she needed some guidance. Right. And I was happy to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And now is a woman who you know, was kind of uh, really lost and, and thought that she had no way out, who is living in a big city and has her own apartment and is discovering life, you right. know, and right. she's 31 years old. And I said, you know, you're not, your next decade, you have, at least you have money to pay your rent, to do things, to travel, but you're also working with very intelligent people. You're learning of all kinds of fields. And uh, it's very exciting for her. So, you know, and for you that too, I gratification, imagine. yes, right. <clears throat> that's, that's the best part of it, right. you know, to see that you could change somebody's direction or path. And, and it happens every day. You know, two days ago, I got a letter from actually a, a woman also in her early 30s who tells me how, what difference this book made in her life. And my previous books, which she had read too, she was a lawyer, very successful young lawyer due to become a partner in New York City, made a lot of money, had a big car, a condo, you name it. And one day decided that, you know, working 90 hours a week in that world was not what she wanted. And she quit everything, moved to Paris, and two years later, she's finished, she went to, she learned French at the Sorbonne, she went to Sciences Po, she met a man, and she's getting married in June. I love stories and like that. <laughs> she'll never come back to the U.S., and she feels like Paris was the city where she always right. was meant to be. Right. Right. I mean, I think it's wonderful, you know, and, and more women have to, to take risk. I mean, that's, that's the challenge. That's one of the themes of your book. Yes. That, they, that you have to take risks. Yes. And too many women, uh, especially young women, are afraid. I mean, if I had to <laughs> eliminate one word uh, in the 21st century when I talk to young women is the word fear. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of, I'm afraid to go for this interview. I'm afraid to move to another city or the, country. Would you say that's the main thing that holds women back? From being it's successful? It's definitely one of the main mm -hmm. things. Fears and, um, and taking risks. Yeah. And, you know, my mother actually, <clears> it's, <throat> it's kind of a, a manifesto in my, in my book because my mother was not a businesswoman, and yet she's the one who taught me my first bin business principle. You know, don't be afraid to take risks. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, what is the worst thing that can happen? Right. And to me... It's that, a great question. Yes. And, and it makes you um, really fearless. Mm -hmm. It made me fearless. And uh, sometimes, like Maria, Ma Maria, for example, was afraid to go for an interview. Uh -huh. And I said, Maria, what's the worst thing that can happen? You don't get the job, right. so move on. You know, right. it wasn't meant to be. A lot of young people graduate from college with a rough map for their futures sort of plotted out in their heads. But one of the mm -hmm. messages in your book is that you can't plan everything. No. that careers like life are unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So if you can't plan your career, if you can't plan your life, what can you do? What well, do you do? Uh, I mean, let's put it that way. You can <laughs> plan it kind of short term, mm -hmm. and you should. But, you know, so many things can happen where you don't have the control and you don't know. I mean, the economy, your, your personal life, your health. 
that you can't, you know, when I hear young girls who said, well, um, by 30, I will have this job and I'll have a house and two kids. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's all well on paper, but you know, it doesn't quite work like that. So yes, you should have dreams and you should have goals and objectives and, and work at it, but take it, you know, Incrementally. Yes. I mean, in life stages. is lived in stages and phases. And, 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 and also because, you know, whatever interests you changes. Look, I was a language major and I moved into business and marketing and, and now book, book uh, uh, writing and all that. So you, you just never know. Right. Which brings us to another point in your book. Your heart should be in your work, but that doesn't mean your heart will always be in the same kind of work. Exactly. That what you want and feel energized about can change over yes. time and you shouldn't be feel that you're stuck with one thing your passions change mm -hmm. i mean and also you your exposure to things look at maria again to take her as an example but i've many other young women i mentored you know who started that way i mean she had a master in biology and now she's in business in luxury business in a major european city and so you know that had very little to do with her mm -hmm education. I mean, education is very important. It opens doors, but then it's, you know, your curiosity, your passions, the people you meet, the life you lead or the one, the life you want to lead, um, the network you have and lots of other things. And some of them unknown. <laughs> you say that uh, communication skills are really, really important. In fact, mm -hmm. that they are the key to a successful career. Yes, I, I believe that, and not only at the CEO level, but <coughs> at any level, entry level jobs, communication skills, uh, too often people think, oh, well, you know, it's, it's uh, being articulate. Well, that's a little section of it, but communication skills go from, you know, the way you talk, but the way also you deal with a person. You know, do you look into this person's eyes? Do you listen? Do you focus? Are you with it? What gesture do you make? What signal you, s you send? And um, then, of course, communication through manners at the table, the way you eat, the way you behave, the way you sit people, the way you treat people. Right. Uh, and then, of course, communication in terms of um, at the workplace, how you collaborate with your colleagues, how you write to them, talk to them, express an ID. I mean, so often, you know, we did this little test in my company. You give the same assignment to three people and they all understood something else. So is it you who don't communicate well? Is it them who don't listen well or don't really mm -hmm. grab? So how do you communicate well? And then, of course, the writing. Uh, communication through writing is very important. Well, two well, of the two of the pointers that you gave about communication that I really liked, uh, writing personal thank you notes, which is right. probably an almost lost art. Well, it's coming back. Oh, is it? Okay. Because people realize, you know, aren't you touched if you get a personal thank you note? Yeah, it's very impressive when, when someone writes to you. I mean, you know. And the other one was telling stories as a way of making a point. Yes. It's very interesting. Yes. And having to, to, to have the, you know, again, because we, especially the 21st century, when we are so into, you know, high tech and, and impersonal, being personal, being human, you mm -hmm. know, we're all fragile human beings. And so not forgetting the, uh, the human side, you mm -hmm. know, there's IQ and EQ and the emotional side. And we women are very good at that mm -hmm. because we're nurturers and we're compassionate and we can't forget that. It's a very, very important part of that communication. I love the idea of having a store of good stories, <laughs> well rehearsed, and some good jokes that yes. you can pull out. Yes. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Marie Giuliano, author of Women, Work, and the Art of Savoir Faire, in just a moment. Okay. Mm. I'm a mommy. I love kids. I'm responsible, loving, nurturing. <gasps> Mama's coming, baby! <laughs> ah! 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 You don't have to be perfect <laughs> to be a perfect parent. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> 
Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Marie Giuliano, author of Women, Work, and the Art of Savoir Faire. It's just been published by the Atria Books Division of Simon and Schuster. How important uh, is physical appearance in the world of business? Very important, and more so for and just unfairly uh, for women than it is for men. Mm -hmm. uh, your first appearance is, is crucial. And um, working in a man's world, I was shocked over and over again how men really do judge you amazingly on By first how you look. impression. Yes, right, how right. you look, how you're dressed, how uh, you behave. Um, but how you look is, is really important. So when you go for a job, make sure to do your research. And you know, if you're gonna work for a luxury company or interview for a luxury company, don't come in flip-flop. Right, or, right. You know, in in a, fact, don't come in flip-flops to any time. Period, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unless you're applying for a job at the beach as a lifeguard. Yeah, lifeguard in California, right. and you know. You talk about ser the importance of serious hair. Yes. Tell me about serious yes. hair. Well, that's actually my American side. I learned that in New York, you know, when I first started working and I was told that it's a bad hair day. And I'm like, what's a bad hair day? But then, of course, July, August came and the humidity and, <laughs> and the rain. And, right. And then I, I understood what it was meant. So your hair can be a mess. And in many, many jobs, um, you know, whether, whether you're a salesperson in, in a store, it doesn't matter the level. Um, there are uh, studies that show that people look at your eye, your eyes, your smile, your hair, and your shoes. Mm -hmm. So your hair is important. I think that's true because I think, you know, I think you get a good haircut, a really good haircut probably yeah. goes a long way. Yes. And I have noticed, I remember there's a, a woman, she's very famous, I won't say her name, but she's a very prominent feminist and writer and publisher and a lot of things. and. Um, when I met her, well, she's always well put together, but I noticed her shoes, her shoes, mm -hmm. no scuff marks. They were, in, they were impeccable. <laughs> yeah, and I looked at it, my, you know, so I said, well, I've got to do better with the feet. But I mean, I think that is, uh, those are hallmarks of yeah, yeah. very successful women. A recurring theme in your book is the importance of being comfortable in one's skin, mm -hmm. bien dans sa peau. What yes. do you mean by that? Uh, it's finding the balance, and it's more crucial today between between your personal life and your professional life. And I strongly believe that it starts in your personal life and the way you uh, you are in your skin. And I learned that um, even more since the publication of French Women Don't Get Fat, which you know six years later is still selling, and I still get email tons of emails every day. Uh, and I have a website on it. And it really, really um, wasn't something I expected to see that so many women, not only in America or France, but all over the world, struggle through their life because of their bad relationship with food and their weight problem and all the things around mm -hmm. it. So, um, and then of course, you know, running a company and growing it from three people to 125 people, I saw a lot of women with um, weight problems. And uh, if you're not comfortable in your skin, uh, it's going to affect the way you feel, the way you act. And one of the greatest reward I get today is when I have emails or I met people at lectures who said, you know, I didn't, didn't write to you, but you've changed my life. Um, three years ago, I was 30 or 40 pounds heavier. I was miserable, and you taught me how to eat, and I'm so happy, and I'm so more productive, and I have so much more energy. My kids love me better. My husband noticed. My colleagues noticed. It's all in one same package. Mm -hmm. It influenced the other. But and being comfortable in one skin is not just about being slim. No, 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 oh no, but but <clears throat> it started by, and, and I'm not sure I like this word slim, you know, it's like, I don't consider myself slim, just normal, normal. Um, and today, the, the, 
especially in the U.S., where the majority of people are now overweight or obese, it's becoming, you know, very accepted. And I'm not going to say that it's bad, but first of all, having been there and being fat, I know that it's impossible to be happy about it. But even that, what you must look at is the health uh, problems surrounded about that. It's, it's a huge burden on you, on your family, on your work, on society, on government, on everything. Mm -hmm. So we have to become responsible to at least try to get a healthy balance. Right. And you know, if you're five pounds overweight, it's not the end of the world. I'm not saying you, know, right. you have to be anorexic and all that. But look at young women today, so many eating disorders because right. of that imbalance. And so if you, if you are comfortable in your skin, and that's the feedback I get from on my website and from women who write to me, that having found that kind of equilibrium has made a huge difference. Right. When at least American women are not worrying about their weight, they are, seem to be worrying about creating balance in their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, how does one go about doing that in, in 60 seconds, you're going to tell us, yes. of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, not in 60 seconds, but, know. you know, it's one of I my know. four anchors. Right, right. And it's the one most often forgotten. It's mm -hmm. the you anchor, your time. Remember, I mean, to me, one of the great luxuries in, in, world, in the world is time. And people say to me, well, I don't have the time. I don't have the time to make a soup for my kids. I don't have the time for me. But you control your time. So you should make some time for you to find that short-term balance if you have a big job and a family and kids, and then also to look at your long-term sustainable balance, which is different. And each of us is different. You know, for you, it might be uh, taking a walk every day. For me, it's doing yoga. For someone else, it might be reading a book or getting a massage, whatever. But so many women feel guilty about it. They think they shouldn't have it. And yet they burn out. And it's right. only when they burn out that they wake up. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking into prevention. Mm -hmm. Prevention. And, you, and you make the point that, you know, nobody can do it for you. Your, your no. employer, the government can't do it for no. you. You have to take yes. your own balance. You yes. have to create it's your own your balance. It's your responsibility. Right. You know, and it goes, in, in our century, it's essential. You know, don't blame uh, the government or the farmers or the school or... You are responsible for what you eat because you are what you eat, for what you put into your body, and for what you do with your life. You know, you, you can get a lot of help, but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. know thyself, know what you want, and know, create your own luck and opportunity, and then make the best of it. That's, that's the best savoir-faire. You offer some tips for avoiding stress, and I have to say that among my favorites were, don't check your bags. <laughs> <laughs> And I like the suggestion that, you know, when you're taking, when, maybe when you, when you are uh, attending a fancy event in the, in the mm -hmm. next place, you, you mail your mm -hmm. formal dress and then mm -hmm. you ship it back. That's a great idea. Well, you know, when you've lost a few like you did <laughs> early in my career, well, I couldn't afford a dress and, and I had to save, you know, two years to get it and then right. it was lost. Right. Uh, you learn the hard way and then you say, no, right. not again. Right. And the other one was take, take time off from your cell phone. Yes. I wish a lot of people would do that. Yes, and you can do it. I've mm -hmm. taught so many people to do it. You know, yes, we are so much more in demand, and, but there's no reason to, to always be. I mean, it becomes like almost, you know, people think that they're so important. You, mm -hmm. can, you, you can be off your cell phone for a couple of hours. It's not going to be the end of the day. Of course, if you have some, you know, if you're a doctor, I mean, there are professions that requires your own call. On the, but most of us, we can do without because mostly it's the kids, it's the spouse, it's a colleague. It's nothing really that urgent. Right. We make it urgent. Right. You know, one of the, 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 um, the thing I talk about in my book is, uh, and I don't spell it, but it's, it's really something I believe in to the, the three H, humility, humor and honesty and humor you know don't take yourself too seriously right take your work seriously but don't take but yourself, yourself. So seriously I mean, I mean i have given that advice to my i have on occasions that i've given speeches or talked to students i say exactly the same thing because when you stop you when you take yourself s seriously you know everything that goes wrong i mean it mm -hmm. just it just creates angst and misery intense you, stress right and yes. uh, take yourself out of it and concentrate yeah. on yeah. the work yes. at the end of your book 
you offer some recipes for entertaining at mm -hmm. home. Why recipes in a book about being successful in your work and Well, you career? see, that's why, I mean, NPR had a great way of defining that book, saying that, you know, it's about business, but not like in any business book. It's about, it's a life tool. It's a rehearsal for some people. It's reinsurance and it's entertaining. And, I, you know, with a French lifestyle, I cannot write about it and not write about entertaining, mm -hmm. especially in a, in a business book, because don't we all know that most business deals are done around the table and usually right. with, a, with some food and wine? Right. So it's very important. And people, I notice, are very intimidated. They think, you know, if, if they are not the greatest chef in the world, they can entertain. It's very easy. It's the same thing about the two or three things about stress. You can, ma you know, you can work on two or three menus and serve them for the rest of your life with right. a little variation. Right. right. So, you know, take it easy. Uh, take it with a, a little dose of humor and have fun. People love to be entertained. Mm -hmm. People love to come to your house. Okay. Well, I'm going to try some of your recipes. I have now read two of your books. I've enjoyed both of them, and Thank I'm you. looking forward to the next one, whatever it's going to be. French Woman Don't Get Fat cookbook coming out in April. Okay, okay. More recipes. <laughs> oh, okay, great. I want to thank Mireille Giuliano for joining us. Women, Work, and the Art of Savoir Faire has just been published by the Atria Books Division of Simon & Schuster. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.